What's going on you guys? My name is Ty Knotts and welcome to Top 5 Unknowns. Throughout history, there have been countless stories and images that suggest time travel may be possible. Although skeptics usually brush evidence off as a hoax or doctored image, many believers stand by images that allegedly prove time travelers visiting various periods in history. In the 1940s, the quality of photography was relatively low, with black and white grainy photos being the final product. This image was captured in 1941 and went viral around 2010. The photo, taken at an event for the reopening of the South Fork Bridge in Canada, shows a crowd of men and women standing beside their cars on the new bridge. At first glance, the image doesn't raise any red flags. The sea of black and white bodies seem like any other photo from this time period. Upon further investigation though, one person seems to stick out. Near the middle of the photo, one man amongst the crowd appears to be dressed in modern clothing. He's sporting a casual t-shirt with an unknown logo across the front and a pair of odd sunglasses that don't seem to match the time period. Even more strange, if you look down at what he's holding in his hands, you can see what appears to be a modern camera. Even if the camera is not brand new for the present time, it definitely exceeds the technology of the 1940s. This photo gained attention in 2004 when it was first presented to the public. It was featured in the Barlorn Pioneer Museum exhibit, Their Past Lives Here. The museum later went on to digitize the image and publish it online next to other historical photos. Once it hit the web, viewers quickly observed that the young man was dressed in attire much too modern for the 1940s. Of course, many of the theories surrounding this mysterious man involve time travel in some form or another. Through online sharing and discussion, the image received a lot of attention and eventually made its way onto news or blogging platforms such as FARC, Boing Boing, and Forget Tomori. Most of the articles published about the image encouraged the concept of time travel, using the man's attire and cameras as evidence. As expected, when believers surfaced, so did skeptics. Skeptics seem to have one important question. If someone were capable of time travel, why would they choose this event to visit? While the reopening of the South Fork Bridge was a big social event in its time, it seems to fall short from important when looking back on it today. Why wouldn't this particular traveler visit a more iconic event? This particular man doesn't seem to be present in any other historical images or events that hold any importance. Another argument from the skeptic's side is that all of the clothing this man is wearing can be explained as appropriate for the 1940s. His shirt logo seems to resemble shirts worn by the Montreal Maroons. His glasses could be a protective pair that, while not popular, did exist and his camera could be debunked as a small portable camera sold by Kodak at the time. Overall, skeptics explain that this photo more than likely shows a man with an odd sense of fashion for his time, and not a time traveler at all. Even with these explanations, believers stand by the idea that this is proof of time travel, and that skeptics are simply part of the plot to keep such technology hidden from the general public. It was proven that the photo was not doctored, so there's no real way to unveil the truth one way or the other. This image will likely forever be in debate. In the Hesdalen Valley in rural central Norway, there occurs a strange light phenomenon that has baffled witnesses and scientists alike for the last 89 years. In the 1930s, witnesses in the area began reporting strange light activity in the sky. At first, reports were vague, but as the activity continued and people began reporting more specific details, the phenomenon gained attention of scientists and researchers. The light show occurs both during the day and at night, either above or below the horizon. The light emits colors of bright white, yellow, and occasionally even red. Along a 7.5 mile stretch across the valley, erratic and seemingly random behaviors make the Hestalen lights even more curious. They can last anywhere from a few seconds to over an hour. Movements performed by the lights include shooting across the sky at high speeds, slowly swaying back and forth over a short distance, or sometimes hovering motionless in mid-air. At first, these lights were only seen rarely. Eventually, their presence peaked from December of 1981 up until mid-1984. 
During this period of high activity, the lights were observed around 15 to 20 times in a single week. Tourists traveled from all over the country during this activity to witness the mysterious lights of unknown origins. Some tourists would stay overnight or days at a time, totally captivated by the unexplainable presence on these displays. In 2010, activity began to slow down and with each passing year, the lights are seen less and less. For now, they can still be observed around 10 times a week during a peak period. Project Hestalen was a scientific research campaign started by UFO Nord and UFO Sweden, which ran from 1983 to 1985. Following this, from 1997 to 1998, a group of students, journalists, and engineers came together to perform what was known as the Triangle Project. This group recorded light activity to find that the lights would form a pyramid shape that would bounce up and down over time. The Hesdalen Automatic Measurement Station was implemented in 1998 to register and record this light activity. A later program named EMBLA brought established scientists and interest students together to observe and document the light activity in an attempt to make sense of the phenomenon. Despite these various projects and programs, there have been no answers or explanations confirmed about the origin or causes of these lights. It's hypothesized that they could be anything from gases in the atmosphere combusting to rock particles reflecting in the sky. Again, nothing has been confirmed despite the wide variety of possible explanations. Ghost photos are perhaps the most popular form of mysterious media, giving viewers a quick chill down their spine regardless of what they believe. Most ghost photos can be disregarded as fake or the product of a photo development error such as a double exposure, a lens flare, or even damaged film. In some cases, such as this one, one of the aforementioned explanations seems likely, which is commonly the case with older alleged photos of the paranormal. It may seem as though this old, grainy, black and white photo is nothing more than a typical group photo. Sir Victor Goddard, a retired RAF officer, took this photo of his squadron in 1919 and later published it in 1975. The squadron served in World War I under Goddard's command. Two days before the group photo, Freddie Jackson, a dedicated air mechanic, was accidentally killed by a faulty plane propeller. Despite his untimely death, it's believed that Jackson made his way into the group photo. On the top row of men, fourth from the left, a clear image of an airman can be seen. However, behind him is where the eerie mystery lies. Behind this man's head, there appears to be a second face. Standing close behind this man, the face can be seen smiling. The ghostly face is quite clear despite the low quality of the photo. After the photo was developed by the photographer and delivered to Goddard, the squadron was instructed to inspect the possibility of paranormal presence. Instantly, the men agreed that the face in the picture was Freddie Jackson. Jackson's funeral was held on the same day this photo was taken, just a few hours earlier. So naturally, the men concluded that Jackson must have been unaware of his death and instinctively attended the required group photo session. Regardless of what you believe about ghostly presences, the original print of this photo was examined and determined to be unaltered. A camera error such as a double exposure could still be an explanation, but in cases such as that, the apparent face would not be so clear and easily identifiable. The fact that every member of the squadron agreed the face belonged to Jackson also plays a major part in arguing against skeptic efforts to explain the photo bomb. Though viewers can debate to no end about the paranormal truth of the photo, there's no way to tell for certain if this is or is not the ghost of a fallen brother. Mary Hardy Reeser was a 67-year-old woman living in St. Petersburg, Florida at the time of her baffling death in 1951. On July 2nd at 8 a.m., Reeser's landlady stopped by her home to deliver a telegram. Reeser did not answer the door and after several attempts, the landlady tried the knob which she described as abnormally hot. She immediately called the police who later arrived to Reeser's home. The officers on the scene walked in on a gruesome and confusing display. Mary Reeser seemed to have been burned alive in a chair. All that remained of the woman's body was a pile of ashes, her backbone and her skull. Oddly, her left foot also remained, seemingly untouched by the flames. Even the cotton house slipper she'd been wearing was left unburnt. 
Nearby plastic items were softened and distorted by the heat of this fire, but they weren't entirely burnt. In fact, it appeared as though the fire occurred in a small area, not spreading along the carpet or other fabric materials in the room. Another odd piece of evidence was the size of Reezer's skull. Her skull had been shrunken by an alarming amount. It was so small, in fact, that it elicited a comment from an official investigator claiming that it was not an illusion due to the removal of facial tissue. Investigators described the skull as as small as a teacup. The conditions of Reezer's death baffled and confused investigators and medical examiners for several years, as it seemed impossible for a body to be almost completely cremated by fire that didn't spread elsewhere whatsoever. One medical examiner presumed that Reezer died from something known as the Wick Effect. The Wick Effect describes a situation in which clothing on a body mixes with body fat and keeps a fire burning much like a wig. The wick effect is often used to explain the phenomenon of spontaneous human combustion. The FBI eventually hypothesized that Reezer, a frequent sleeping pill user, must have fallen asleep with a lit cigarette which ignited her nightclothes and initiated the wick effect. Over the years, many have disputed the FBI's ruling. Additionally, the wick effect and alleged occurrence of spontaneous human combustion have been researched and tested all over the world. While there's still been small breakthroughs and few answers, an exact recreation has yet to be accomplished leaving the theories as nothing more than theories. Frequently referred to as Our Lady of Light, Zaytun refers to the supernatural apparition of the Virgin Mary that was witnessed in an area of Egypt in April of 1968. On April 2nd, 1968, Farak Mohammed Atwa, a Muslim bus driver, was working across the street from St. Mary's Coptic Church when he thought that he caught a glimpse of a young woman standing at the top of the church on the verge of taking her own life. Two men passing the scene claim they saw a white glow of a female figure. The group called the police in an attempt to save the life of what they thought was a random woman. As police arrived, a crowd began to grow in the street. Officers determined that there was no woman on the roof, and instead, spectators were seeing the reflection of street lamps against the church's bright roof. Crowd members insisted that what they were seeing was very clearly a supernatural apparition resembling the Virgin Mary. The impromptu event lasted a few minutes before the crowd dispersed. A week later, the phenomenon occurred again, once more attracting a small crowd. After this, the sightings began to occur several times a week, sometimes with up to five instances reported in a single work week. This marvel continued until 1971. At one point, the church appointed priests and bishops to investigate the matter. This team confirmed that the spirit of Virgin Mary was being seen. After this confirmation, countless images were taken of the apparition and shared in newspapers and magazines all over the country. Police investigators were unable to find any sign that this was a prank or a hoax. The Egyptian government, having no other logical explanation, eventually accepted the apparition as true. Many pubs in the UK and Ireland have historic standing and have run from the same old buildings for as long as 100 years or more. It's no new discovery that paranormal events tend to happen in older locations with colorful history. Most convincing ghost stories or evidence come from old buildings just like this one, with long and sometimes dark pasts. The White Lion Pub in Hampshire was built in the 17th century and provided locals with a familiar place to have a good time. Since its grand opening long ago, it's been converted to better accommodate locals and tourists. The White Lion offers a bed and breakfast experience to those that check in. In the last few years, visitors and employees alike have reported strange paranormal happenings in the pub. Guests have reported hearing voices and footsteps in the late hours of the night only to find an empty hallway. Employees have mostly noted objects mysteriously moving on their own without explanation. Some of these claims may be proven to be true thanks to the footage that was caught by the pub's manager. The video shows a CCTV camera point down at a staircase, which either leads to the main bar or to the kitchen. No living persons are seen in the frame or anywhere in the staircase. A few seconds into this upload, the footage of the ghost can supposedly be seen. At first, the sighting can be described as smoke. It seems to have a fluid motion. However, as the figure moves toward the right of the screen, you can definitely identify a male figure wearing loose flowing clothing. The outfit waves in the wind, though there's no wind. 
The mysterious figure moves slightly to the right of the screen and then suddenly vanishes. It's been said that the White Lion hosts a variety of different spirits, some friendly and others not so much. It's impossible to determine which this spirit is, but the manager of the pub explains that this footage was captured after the alarm went off and prompted her to check the footage. Apparently, there's one spirit that frequently sets off the alarm, and they refer to him as James Rogers. This short clip, captured with the CCTV security surveillance of a parking garage, claims to have caught a ghostly janitor continuing his work. In the frame of the video, two large garage doors are placed between bright yellow pillars. As the footage zooms closer, the leftmost garage door begins to open slowly. No one is seen inside or outside of the garage prompting it to open. As the mystery grows, it's revealed that the garage is completely empty. Just a few seconds after opening though, a broom is placed in the doorway to the right. It's leaned against the doorway carefully, which could make the viewer conclude that there is someone inside. It could be that the person is placing the broom down just out of the view of the camera. But this can't be true considering how the broom is being moved. The broom lifts off the ground and floats for just a second before it's placed back into a still position. When that movement is made, we can observe two things. One, human hands or a hand gripping the broom to move it. And two, if someone tossed the broom instead of holding it, the broom would fall instead of float to its fixed position. Clearly, neither of these things are visible, which makes this activity eerie and possibly paranormal. The video uploaded by the Daily Mail was captured in a station by New South Wales Police. It's likely that a security member noticed the door opening and later checked the footage to discover this chilling event. There are no reports of previous paranormal activity in this location, and the video has yet to be explained. This footage aired on ABC World News in 2014 and was later uploaded to their YouTube channel as part of a short highlights compilation. New Mexico Police Surveillance recorded this footage of a ghostly figure in the garage at their station. The video shows an empty garage, late at night completely empty. A translucent white mass randomly appears and travels from the upper right side of the frame to the left. Once near the left side, the figure either disappears or can no longer be seen by the camera. Considering how the mass looks, it's clearly not a living human. However, upon a second look, the figure seems to be in the shape of an average male. Furthermore, if you watch around where the legs would be on this apparition, the movement resembles a walking motion. According to their story, a security officer monitoring the footage noticed the presence on camera and assumed it was someone breaking in. When the area was inspected though, there was no one to be found. All the gates and doorways were locked as usual and the alarm system was not triggered. The officer reviewed the footage and can find no logical explanation for it. They were quite spooked upon watching the video and the majority agreed that it had to have been a paranormal occurrence. 
On June 26th, 2019, this video was uploaded by user Sugu Amesi. It's only gotten about 50 views, but considering how new and baffling it is, it's sure to grow in popularity in the coming months. This upload was about a minute and a half long and allegedly shows proof of the afterlife. This video was obviously filmed from a phone or separate camera of the footage being played back on the surveillance program. In the video, the CCTV camera of the nearby business is pointed at an empty parking lot and busy street. There's a small road median with flashing lights to the left of the frame. The median is part of the intersection for traffic and is frequently used for crossing pedestrians. The pedestrian was very different from the usual passers-by seen at this location. Just below the flashing lights, about 12 seconds into the clip, a strange white translucent cloud appears out of nowhere. The object manifests and looks like some human being walking toward the street. Of course though, the figure is not human. The ghostly sighting glows in the surveillance footage. This is either the result of the ghost's paranormal energy or perhaps it's just the reflection of lights along the street. Either way, it glows in an almost magical yet unsettling way. After becoming visible, it walks toward the street as if to cross but again begins to float upward. As it floats toward the sky, the human-like details begin to fade away. A white, glowing orb floats as a ring of white waves follow it. The waves follow it looking like smoke or a thin, loose cape flowing in the wind. The orb moves slowly upward at first and then abruptly shoots toward the sky, gleaming even brighter than before. The footage plays back several times with some frames being slowed down or even zoomed in on. With each round of the video, the event becomes more and more confusing and supernatural. The description of the video offers nothing more than the location of the camera, which is Port Moresby. This ghostly footage was uploaded by Viral Press in June of 2019. According to the description, this 3 minute video was sent in by a night guard in the Philippines. While working the late shift at a car park, this guard noticed something odd on his monitor. CCTV cameras inside the car park showed an unexplainable figure moving around. The apparition has been described as more of an object since it doesn't really have many similarities to a human. The bright white glowing object seems to be laying on the ground or floating near the camera. Both are possible with this kind of angle. The object doesn't seem to stand upright or have any limbs, yet it still has moving parts that stick out and wiggle. Overall, the figure can be described as a mysterious creature trying to crawl around. The object struggles as it inches around in the view of the camera, and the night guard described the apparition's movement as vibrating. Eventually, after a period of scooting around on the camera, the figure swiftly jumps up and flies away. Footage shows that it comes back later to repeat the same motions on the camera. This time it stays for about 3 minutes. We're unable to translate what the guard was saying in the video, but if you happen to know, feel free to tell us in the comments. Nevertheless, we can assume he's expressing his confusion over the strange visitor.
The Queen Mary was voted by Time Magazine as one of the top 10 most haunted places in America, and the reports hold up to that reputation. The long-retired British ship sailed through the North Atlantic from 1936 to 1967. During its time at sea, it built an impressive resume of both interesting and disturbing events. The ship was first used as an express service for traveling passengers. However, the ship was also involved with war travels on several occasions and was captured and reclaimed by various sides of several wars, specifically the First World War. Following the war, it returned to its original purpose of being a passenger ship and made its last sail in 1967 after a critical decrease in profits. The biggest tragedy aboard the ship occurred in World War II when it collided with a Nazi ship while holding US troops. Only 99 of the 338 passengers survived the crash. At least 49 other deaths have been confirmed aboard the Queen Mary. 18-year-old crewman John Petter was accidentally crushed in door number 13 of the ship's engine room during a routine drill in 1966. Other deaths during the ship's years of sail were caused by illness, falling accidents, and other unlucky events. A more recent incident occurred in 2011 at what is now a tourist site of Queen Mary. A visitor, Kelly Ryan, was at the edge of the ship when she somehow accidentally fell overboard. Witnesses reported that her boyfriend tried to grab her in an attempt to save her life, but was unable to hold his grasp. The 26-year-old woman fell to the freezing water below and did not survive. Before the ship was officially retired, crew members and passengers began reporting paranormal activity aboard the craft. Claims included various objects mysteriously moving on their own, unidentifiable knocks and cries, and even footsteps in the night, and even more unsettling stories about poltergeist, possessions, and apparitions. When the ship was officially retired, the US made use of these eerie reports and turned the Queen Mary into a guest destination. It was marked not only as an educational historic landmark, but also a hub for paranormal experiences, which attracted a unique but massive group of paying visitors. Now, the Queen Mary offers cabins for guests to stay overnight, haunted tours, and investigation opportunities for paranormal enthusiasts. Since this era of the ship's lifetime, even more spooky reports have poured in. Guests describe similar experiences to those shared before the ship's retirement. Now though, many cases include evidence such as photos, videos, and EVP recordings. 
Some notable visitors that have allegedly captured evidence include the Ghost Hunters team, National Geographic, and Ghost Brothers. The USS Constitution is the oldest commissioned naval ship still afloat. The ship was named by President George Washington and was launched in 1797. Her most notable accomplishment was during the War of 1812, when she captured numerous merchant ships and defeated British warships. The work of the USS Constitution did not end here though. She circled the war as a flagship in the 1840s, served as a training ship during the American Civil War, and carried important artwork in 1878. She was officially retired in 1880. Despite attempts, the ship has yet to be scrapped because it holds adoration from the public as a historical ocean craft with significant history in American endeavors. Now the ship travels with a purpose devoted to education, historical demonstration, and participation in public historical events and ceremonies. In addition to her meaningful work, she's kept open to the public year-round and free tours are provided. It's currently docked at Boston's Freedom Trail next to its own USS Constitution Museum. It's unclear how many confirmed deaths have occurred aboard the ship. It is confirmed though that life has been lost while at sea. Alleged reports describe accidents during the ship's construction in which men at work died from work-related freak accidents. Additionally, during the War of 1812, some lives were lost due to war injuries, sea illnesses, and falls aboard. Though it seems that no deaths occurred during the ship's work in the late 1800s, it's impossible to confirm or deny due to a lack of documents. Regardless, in the past, crew members have claimed during the war and the endeavors that followed, and have shared stories of supposed hauntings. Claims range from tales of objects mysteriously moving on deck and ghostly apparitions of soldiers. In one instance, a cannonball even moved on its own while the ship was still docked. Since the ship has been open to the public, there have been an influx of paranormal reports. Strange occurrences have happened to both visitors and crew members, similar to reports from the past. Some crew members have even stated that they witnessed apparitions of soldiers or felt a negative energy which reminded them of the presence of a soldier. It's no surprise that a ship with this kind of history would be haunted by the spirits lost while on board, and it's fortunate that the ship is still available today for visitors. The Star of India was built in 1863 as an iron-hulled sailing ship. She had a bountiful career with a variety of tasks and responsibilities. She was officially retired in 1926 and unfortunately laid dormant for several decades. Finally, attention was turned back toward the vessel and it was restored in the early 1960s due to its impressive design and historical past. The Star of India was deemed a seaworthy museum ship and home ported at the Maritime Museum of San Diego. The historical landmark is one of the oldest ships still sailing regularly and has become a popular visitor location for historians and paranormal enthusiasts alike. There's only one confirmed death that occurred aboard the vessel. The story claims that a stowaway was caught within the technical room of the ship and died later. The name of the stowaway was never revealed and became unknown over time. Apparently, after being discovered, the crew put a stowaway to work on deck when he somehow slipped and suffered a head injury that he did not survive. Very little information about the tragedy is available, but some speculate that the event occurred due to a lack of experience from the worker. After his passing, crew members began to experience strange paranormal activity while on the ship. Some of the activity described include apparitions of an unknown man seemingly in pain. Additionally, employees reported that while standing in a specific spot on the deck, a chilling sensation could be felt, and these claims have held up for visitors even to this day. Additionally, the fact that the ship is still regularly sailing the sea with guests aboard provides a unique and thrilling experience. Hopefully, the ship will become a place for more paranormal investigation and evidence in years to come. The Belle of Louisville is a notoriously haunted ship and was featured in a captivating episode of Sci-Fi Channel's Ghost Hunters in 2013. The steamboat, which is owned and operated by Louisville, Kentucky, has reportedly been haunted for 100 years. The ship was built in 1914 and holds impressive all-time records for miles traveled, years of operation, and places to visit. That being said, the vessel has a colorful past filled with a long history of crew members, passengers, visitors, and cargo. Captain Ben Winters had a long and fulfilling career on the sea over the course of his lifetime. He was the captain of the Bell in 1947 and spent many years on the ship and was adored by crew members as a friendly and inspiring mentor. He died aboard the ship after falling ill while at sea. 
His deathbed wish was for the ship to take on the name Avalon, the previous name of a beloved ship that the captain previously oversaw. Unfortunately, the name change did not stick for many years and some speculate that the reason behind this is that Captain Winter's spirit allegedly haunts the vessel today. Shortly after the name was changed, crew members started to notice a strange presence on the ship. Some past members reported very detailed and impressive encounters with an apparition that was so realistic they didn't even realize it was paranormal. Similarly, visitors and passengers today have wildly reported that they were taken on a very informative tour by someone who called themselves Captain Winters. Of course, operators later explained that there's no member by that name anymore. It's possible that these events were the work of pranksters on board. However, some other evidence is harder to dismiss. In some cases, objects have mysteriously moved on their own, and visitors have been touched, pinched, or pushed by an invisible presence. This ship is one of the most popular haunted ships today, known as USS Yorktown. ColonialGhost.com gives a brilliant timeline of the ship's operation. The site states, the USS Yorktown is a haunted living museum that's sure to delight ghost hunters and fear fans. Encounter maritime spirits and relive important American naval battles aboard this grand vessel. She's named after the Battle of Yorktown, which ended in a decisive victory by Franco-American forces. The city of Yorktown is just as historically significant as Colonial Williamsburg. During its voyages from 1943 to 1974, there have been an astounding 140 confirmed deaths of crew members, passengers, and stowaways. Speculations assume that many of these spirits never left the vessel, which now serves as a museum. Crew members over the decades and visitors of the landmark report shadowy figures, unexplained noises in the middle of the night, and of course, mysterious poltergeist activity involving the movement of furniture, personal items, and cargo materials. Luckily for those that dabble in the paranormal, or even those that just have a morbid sense of curiosity, Yorktown Ghost Tours offers a variety of tours aboard the vessel, which include not only educational historical information, but the opportunity for guests to capture their own evidence. Some visitors have published photos, videos, and recordings online that allegedly hold proof such as strange humanoid figures, apparitions, energy orbs, and more. In December of 2015, a local TV news reporter for KIMT3 was doing a report in Rochester, Minnesota. The report was about a bank robbery which took place a day before. The bank was a Sterling State Bank in Rochester. During the news report, a man came running towards a reporter pointing at someone. The man who came running out the bank was actually pointing at the bank robber. It turns out the bank robber returned the day after robbing the bank for the first time to try and rob it again. During the live report, after the bank employee points out the robber to the reporter, the rep Porter cuts a report short to call the police. Tyler, just 24 hours ago, this bank in North... What? Oh, that's the robber. Uh, this is live TV, folks. That's the robber just went by, uh, according to the bank uh, employee. So I got to go here and call 911. I'll talk to you later. Later on, the police arrested a 36-year-old after pulling him over in a vehicle on Highway 52 south of Minneapolis. It turns out the man had robbed different banks in the past. The man was 36-year-old Ryan Liskow. He returned to the bank as when he robbed it the day before, he got $3,000 from the bank which he spent in one purchase to buy drugs which he used to get high. After doing most of the $3,000 worth of drugs, he returned the next day to get more money to buy more drugs. Once he returned to the bank, he was spotted by people who phoned the police, leading to his arrest. The robber was charged in federal court with two counts of bank robbery. When he was arrested, he had a bag with him containing cocaine and appeared to be under the influence of drugs at the time of his arrest. Before robbing the bank, he had been living in a halfway house in Rochester for robbing a bank in Minneapolis in 2009. In 2015, Stuart Finders was doing a report for the BBC. The report was about a soccer match which took place in 1967. The match was between the two English soccer teams Liverpool and Everton. The match took place at Goodson Park. Goodson Park is a soccer stadium in Walton, Liverpool, England. It was constructed in 1892. In 1967, a match took place there. It was a game in the FA Cup fifth round. The FA Cup is an annual elimination soccer competition which started in 1871. The match between Everton and Liverpool took place on March the 11th, 1967. In goal for Liverpool was a man by the name of Tommy Lawrence. Everton won the match by one point after scoring a goal. 
Liverpool was eliminated from the tournament. Everton players and officials celebrated with champagne in their dressing room after their victory. 48 years later in 2015, the BBC done a report on the match. Reporter Stuart Flinders went to the streets of Liverpool to interview random people to see if they remembered the match. During one interview, he speaks to an old man and asks him if he remembers a game and the man replies with, I should do, I was in goal. Yeah, do you, I played in it. Did you? I was goalkeeper for Liverpool. Really? Yeah. The reporter is then shocked to find out by chance he was speaking to Tommy Lawrence. He was a goalie for Liverpool during the match. This next coincidence has happened at least two times on the news. It is the coincidence of the news anchor reporting on crimes only to look like the mock shot they show. The first case comes from ABC7 News. Mark Brown is a co-anchor for ABC7 Eyewitness News at 5pm and 11pm. He joined ABC7 in 1989 as a reporter and weekend anchor. He was born in Los Angeles. Back in 2006, Mark Brown was reporting on a rape case which took place in a movie theater somewhere in the United States. When it came time to display the mugshot of the suspect, by chance the image looks similar to the reporter Mark Brown resembling the same facial hair and hairline. After the image made it to the internet, it became a meme and many people wondered if it was real. The image was real and it was merely a coincidence. This same coincidence happened once again with a different reporter. Mike Helgren is a reporter for CBS Baltimore. In 2011, Mike was reporting on an assault which happened in Baltimore. Mike was reporting on the breaking news that the local police were hunting down a man who punched a woman in a road rage attack. Once again, when the sketch of the suspect was revealed, it seemed to resemble the reporter. Like the previous case, this was only a coincidence. WKTV is an NBC CBS affiliate which broadcasts in New York City. On the 28th of December 2016, the station ran an accidental emergency alert. The alert read, Civil authorities have issued a hazardous material warning for the United States, effective until September 29th, 2.16 a.m. It then randomly read, Would you, could you, on a train question mark, wait for further instructions. Soon after the alert went out, the station tweeted that they made an error and the alert was not meant to be sent out. Just hours later on the following day of September 29th, 2016, a New Jersey transit train crashed in Hoboken, which killed a young mother and injured a hundred others. The train crashed into pillars which held up the roof of the station, causing it to come crashing down on hundreds of people. An investigation started and black box recordings were taken from the train. However, there was no explanation put forward as to what caused the crash. After the crash happened, people remembered the strange 6pm emergency broadcast which mentioned a train. People started to believe the crash and the emergency alert were somehow linked. After the crash happened, the news station claimed that the emergency alert was caused by a hack. The whole event turned out to be a coincidence. However, many people have gone online to claim that there was a conspiracy. In 2011, a 26-year-old man by the name of Stephen McDaniel began to stalk his 27-year-old Mercer University law school classmate Lauren Giddens. He began to video record her in secret through the windows of her apartment. He stalked and recorded her for months. He developed an obsession with her which soon turned fatal. June 25th, 2011 was the last day Lauren Giddens was seen alive. She was last seen buying fast food for dinner on her way home. Several days passed before she was reported as missing. This was as people assumed she had secluded herself to study. After a considerable amount of time passed without making contact, the police were made aware of her disappearance. On the 30th of June 2011, the police travelled to the apartment complex to see if they could find Lauren. When they went there, they parked in front of the trash cans which were meant to be taken. As the trash cans were blocked by the police cars, the garbage men didn't take the garbage. This would later lead to the discovery of Lauren's body. It turns out Stephen McDaniel murdered Lauren and dismembered her body, placing it in trash cans at the apartment complex. On Sunday, June 26, 2011, Stephen McDaniel broke into Lauren's apartment dressed in all black while wearing a mask. He woke her up at 4.30 a.m. He strangled her to death where he then took her into the tub and dismembered her. He then went on to dispose of her body in the trash cans. Shortly after her body was discovered, the news station WGXA went to the crime scene for coverage. While there, they began to carry out random interviews. By chance, they ended up interviewing her murderer, Stephen McDaniel. The interview seems to be going fine until he has told the news of her body being discovered. Following this, he becomes speechless and needs to take a breather. I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? All right. Shortly after this, Stephen was arrested and charged with the murder of Lauren. He was sentenced to life in prison but can request parole in 2041.
There have been conflicting reports of where this next video is filmed. Some outlets claim India while others claim Saudi Arabia. The people in the video are speaking Arabic so it's most likely Saudi Arabia. The original video post claimed it was filmed at the Bar Malta Ridge in Kuwait. The video is believed to be filmed near the Saudi border. In the darkness of the night, two men were travelling down a dirt road. To their surprise, they notice what appears to be a woman who starts to chase them. The woman is wearing a white gown with a hunchback while carrying a sort of cane or stick. She makes creepy and odd movements as she chases the men. The men can be heard screaming in terror. When translated, it's found out that one of the men is telling the other to drive while the other man is replying, telling them that the vehicle is stuck. <laughs> By the end of the video, the woman begins to scream at them. They respond in fear and quickly drive away. There have been many explanations as to what took place. Some believe the men came across an actual witch. In Saudi Arabia, the officials consider witches as a serious problem. A witch is a female practitioner of witchcraft. Witchcraft is the practice of magical skills and abilities. Some of the skills and abilities include conjuring, necromancy, spell learning, and much more. In 2009, the government of Saudi Arabia launched an anti-witchcraft unit. Its aims were to educate the public about witchcraft and its spells, and along with this, also locate and put a stop to active witches in the country. In Saudi Arabia, witchcraft is punishable by death. They take witchcraft very seriously as they believe in entities known as jinn. In the Western world, jinn are seen as an aspect of Islamic mythology. They're described as supernatural creatures in early pre-Islamic Arabian and later Islamic mythology. The jinn have been described as smokeless fire. In Middle Eastern countries, unlike the Western world, they believe that the jinn are real. They believe that they are interdimensional entities located in a subspace between the third and fourth dimension. It's believed that black magicians are able to conjure the jinn and get them to work for them. In Islam, it's believed that people can pay black magicians to conjure jinn to then disrupt the lives of people by haunting them and causing mental anguish. The black magicians, whether male or female, are also believed to be able to become possessed by the jinn, needing an exorcism to remove it. This is the reason why Saudi Arabia takes witchcraft so seriously and started the anti-witchcraft unit. As for the video, it may have been a witch caught on tape. Shortly after the video was made public in 2014, there was a news story of an old woman being stopped at the Qatar border close to where the video was filmed. She was stopped due to having witchcraft paraphernalia. There has been another, much simpler explanation. This explanation is that the event was a prank pulled on a new recruit at the Saudi border. Whatever the case may be, the video still remains terrifying. <laughs> This next video predates 2007. It comes from a graveyard in Mexico. An independent reality show in Mexico went to a small town after locals kept reporting an odd disturbance at one of the cemeteries. People in the village claimed they would frequently hear what sounded like a child crying in a cemetery. It gets stranger than this though, they couldn't find the source of the crime. As more and more villagers witnessed the phenomenon, word soon spread to different towns in Mexico. This led to a man who had his own independent reality show to travel to the graveyard to investigate. He traveled alone with only a camera. Out of all the time he could have gone, he decided to go there at midnight. In the low quality footage, the sounds of a girl can be heard. Soon after, the camera catches a sight of a figure sitting beside a grave. The man calls out to the figure and it turns around appearing to be a girl. The man immediately gets scared and starts to run away. The clip is very scary. As there are sound effects in the clip, some claim that it is fake. These could have been added onto the original video. <laughs> Amiga, niña, ay, no sé si me voy a decir, ya me digo la Many people may not know, but ghosts have been proven to be an actual phenomenon which really do hang around graveyards. Robert Monroe was a man born on the 30th of October 1915 in Indiana, United States. In the 1950s, when he was in his 40s, he started to feel a strange vibration in his chest area. Every time he would lay down, the vibration would intensify and he would begin to have spontaneous out-of-body experiences. The first time it happened to him, it almost put him into shock as he believed he was going through the dying process. He quickly made re-entry into his physical body. After these began to happen more and more frequently, he went and visited several different doctors and psychiatrists to find out what was happening to him. Each one they went to told him he was fine mentally and physically. One doctor told him he was probably starting to have some type
type of spiritual breakthrough. As out-of-body experiences would happen to him close to every night, he learned how to control them. He now became dedicated to mapping out the out-of-body world. With this came the afterlife and the different phases of consciousness. He spent from the 1950s until his death in the 1990s mapping out the different dimensions of the universe that we travel to after death. He wrote what he discovered about ghosts. He called ghosts the locked-ins. He claimed they exist just outside of the third dimension. This is what he wrote about the locked-ins or what we have come to call ghosts. This group is composed solely of those who have permanently exited their current physical body who are dead physically but don't know it. This group is totally and compulsively bonded to time-space materiality. They appear to be deep into enveloping emotionally based fears and drives which are their attempt to act out. They are trying to constantly continue a physical existence to which they have become habituated. They often remain around physical locations such as houses and physically live in persons to whom they have become attached. Some continue to attempt re-entry into their dead physical bodies to try and reactivate them, which may give credence to the strange radiation perceived at cemeteries. Until they are reached and assisted or some glimmer of awareness occurs, they remain in this locked-in state what we consider as years and sometimes centuries. Their numbers increase constantly and will continue to do so as long as the physical human values that generate the condition remain unchanged. So considering during the out-of-body experiences he saw recently deceased people trying to re-enter their corpses at cemeteries, the person who made the video may have actually caught a ghost of a girl at the graveyard. Amiga! Niña! Ay, no seas imbécil! ¡Hello! In 2009, a YouTuber by the name of You Know It Joe uploaded a video called Creeper in My Apartment. Before rolling the footage, the YouTuber explains the events leading to it. He claimed he continued to find food missing in his apartment which remained unaccounted for. He claimed he questioned his girlfriend about it who denied it was her. He then set up a video believing he would catch his girlfriend in the act. What he found was far creepier. The hidden camera showed a woman emerging from his attic who goes on to eat his food and drink directly out of cartons. The woman had allegedly been living in his attic of his Manhattan apartment without his knowledge. Other than the footage, there is no further information such as an investigation taking place and who the woman was and so on. The only other information was what was included in the video description. In the description, the uploader who is the same person in the video described how he is an actor called Joe Cummins. He also listed a movie he starred in. Because of the little information and and the fact that the uploader was an actor, many people have speculated that the video is fake. This is most likely true as at 20 seconds into the video while he's setting up the camera, the person can be seen in the background waiting to appear. Also in the start of the video when he is describing the situation, you can see that he has prepared what he wants to say and it isn't spontaneous. During his description, he doesn't blink a single time. Through body language, this indicates that what he is saying is not spontaneous and he's trying to stay focused on what he prepared. When we naturally talk with no preparation, our body language will always give away if we're telling the truth. Every human, when they're talking about something they believe is the truth, they will automatically blink twice or double blink when talking about their truth. It's literally the mind associating with the truth, double blinking to confirm it as their truth. So the body language of the uploader indicates that the video was a forgery. However, although the video may have been a fake, a year before it was uploaded, a real situation took place which actually had a person hiding out in someone's home. In 2008 in Tokyo, Japan, a 58-year-old homeless woman was found living inside a man's closet. Much like the fake video, in the real case, the man had discovered that food started to mysteriously go missing. The man installed security cameras which sent images to his phone. One of the cameras caught the woman on tape. The homeowner quickly phoned the police who went to the house. When they arrived, the person found a 58-year-old woman. The woman told them that she was homeless and had been living in the home for a year. She snuck in after the owner left the home unlocked. She then lived in his closet and ate his food along with taking showers. So as the real case happened just a year before the fake video was made, it seems to be a direct inspiration. This next video was made on the 28th of July 2011. The video was made in Oregon, United States. The YouTuber claimed over the summer of 2011, he kept hearing strange sounds coming from the sewer near his home in Oregon. As the noises continued to happen, the person wanted to try and make contact with what he believed was a creature in the sewer. He took a night vision camera with him as he decided to go exploring at night, plus it would have been dark in the sewer. While exploring, he made his way towards the direction the noises were coming from. He soon came across the source. He came across what appears to be a pale white, hairless creature with glowing eyes. He is laying on the sewer floor and contorts his body to look at the cameraman. Once the cameraman catches a glimpse of the creature, he quickly flees from the scene. I'm coming up on the tunnel right now. I'm hearing the noises inside the tunnel and I really just want to make contact with this creature. Hello? 
I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. I just... I, I just want to hurt you. I just want to hurt you. I just other than the information stated in the video, no more info was given. The person who filmed the video believed he came across an alien which was hiding out in the sewer. This next video comes from the early days of YouTube. It was actually one of the first scary videos I'd ever seen on the platform. The video was uploaded onto YouTube in 2007. It is entirely in Japanese. The video shows a young Asian girl who is sitting in front of a mirror. Over the video is Japanese narration. The video seems to be normal until taking a creepy and unexpected turn. The girl turns around to look at herself in the mirror. When she does, after she is done looking at herself, the reflection remains staring at her. Many people found the video extremely creepy. Others went on to claim how it is easily faked. The video first aired on a Japanese entertainment show, therefore it was possibly made directly for TV. Shortly after the video was put up on YouTube in 2007, YouTuber Captain Disillusion debunked the video and proved how motion tracking and video editing was used on the video. Video. So yes, the video is faked, although it is quite noticeable that it was. Aside from it being faked, the video was well done as it remains creepy. <laughs> In 1982, 20-year-old Tony Jones and his brother Tim were hitchhiking across Australia for a six-month journey. For three weeks, Tony caught rides with strangers as a means of travel, while Tim rode his bicycle across the country. In order to keep in contact and update each other on their progress, the brothers would call home and leave messages with family. The two met up briefly in McKay and Airlie Beach. They then spent a week together in the company of two fellow travelers at Sun City Caravan Park before heading off to Mount Isa. Tim set off on the journey on his bike while Tony planned to visit a city on October 28th before arriving in Townsville on November 3rd. Upon calling home to check in, he was surprised to learn that his brother had already arrived in Mount Isa. His mother let him know that she had deposited $150 into his account that he and his brother shared, not knowing that it was the last time that she would speak to her son. When Tony failed to make another phone call and he had not used any of the money in the account, an investigation was launched into his disappearance. In January of 1983, police received a tip in the form of a letter saying, I believe the body of A.J. Jones is buried in or near Fullerton River within 100 yards south side of the Flanders Highway. It wasn't until January of 2011 when Jones's family was contacted by the man who had found this letter 29 years prior and a search was conducted. The river was dry at the time of the investigation, but in the weeks before the letter was originally discovered in 1983, it had flooded with over 20 feet of water, washing away any possible evidence that may have existed. Police later confessed to losing the letter along with the evidence handed in around the same time, consisting of some camping gear and a letter found addressed to Tony from his mother. In October of 2011, a former prisoner at the Townsville Correctional Center said that in the year 2000, his cellmate told him, quote, they did a bloke out near Mount Isa. An inquest was launched, but it was delayed through 2015. It was then discovered that the man who was possibly involved in Tony's disappearance had already passed away before being interviewed by police. There have been no other suspects in this case, and the whereabouts of Tony Jones are still unknown to this day. On March 24, 1974, 21-year-old Janet Taylor was visiting with friends at the university campus in Palo Alto, California. At approximately 7 p.m., she began to grow concerned about her Doberman pinchers waiting for her at home. They'd been alone in the house for most of the day and Janet needed to take them outside. She said goodbye to her friends for what would be the last time and set out to hitchhike the short distance home. Early the next morning, a milk truck driver would discover her remains in a ditch just over four miles from campus. Janet's case remained cold until 2018, when advancements in DNA testing helped crack another case in Palo Alto. Investigators were able to use standard DNA testing in conjunction with genealogy to build a family tree of people who were related to the unnamed suspect in the murder of 21-year-old Leslie Perlov. They narrowed down their search based on gender, age, location, and other characteristics. Through relatives, they were able to identify the man who killed Leslie, whose body was found under a tree in Palo Alto a year before Janet's. The DNA discovered in Leslie's case belonged to John Gertrude, a man who'd been working at the university heart transplant unit as a medical technician in 1974, when Janet was hitchhiking the short distance hole. 
Police had long suspected Gertrude was involved and submitted additional items for testing in Janet's case, hoping for a match, which was ultimately discovered on the pants Janet was wearing that night that she was picked up. Gertrude had two prior convictions for crimes against women, both in 1964 and 1975. He's set to stand trial on September 21st, 2020, after pleading not guilty at his hearing in June. Without the advancement in DNA testing and the ability to trace DNA using genealogy, Janet's case likely would have never been connected to Gertrude and remained cold to this day. Tammy Mahoney was just 19 when she disappeared in Oneida, New York on May 8, 1981. The aspiring veterinarian was attending Morrison College and was described by her classmates as being friendly and popular. Tammy was planning to hitchhike from Oneida to nearby Hamilton to visit with friends when she accepted a ride from a stranger on Route 46. For reasons unknown, it's believed the person or persons who picked up Tammy took her to a party on 32 acres located on the Oneida National Tribal Land. Witnesses reported seeing her at this party and it was the last known sighting of Tammy. When she failed to show up in Hamilton three days later, Tammy's boyfriend reported her missing. A tip was given to law enforcement leading them to believe that a group of 12 or 14 people may have been involved in what happened to Tammy. Due to a lack of evidence, however, they were unable to make an arrest. In 2003, the case was presented to the grand jury, but no progress was made. In 2006, another tip was passed on to law enforcement. This led them to a metal drum buried in Sullivan just 15 minutes away from Oneida. The contents of the drum have not been released to the public, but it's confirmed that her body was not located. Because there was no solid evidence in Tammy's case, police are still relying heavily on more witnesses to come forward. With so many people attending the party the night that she disappeared, someone must have seen or heard something. The people who are responsible for her disappearance have kept quiet for nearly 40 years, and the truth about what happened to Tammy while on her way to visit friends remains a mystery to this day. On August 25, 1981, 18-year-old Jeannie Moore left her Lakewood, Colorado home late and in a hurry to start her morning shift at the nearby Tenneco gas station. She was known to hitchhike to work and witnesses spotted her getting into either a red Ford LTD or a Galaxy on the I-70 near her home at approximately 7.10 a.m. When she didn't show up for work that morning, her manager phoned her mother, who immediately reported her missing as it wasn't like Jeannie to miss a shift. It'd be five days before picnickers would discover human remains 11 miles from Jeannie's home, in Genesee Park, that would quickly be identified as the missing girl. DNA was collected at the scene and police departments looked into several suspects, including someone in Jeannie's own family. They exhausted all leads in her case, and unfortunately, it went cold for nearly 40 years. In 2011, investigators re-examined the evidence and created a DNA profile, which they then uploaded into CODIS, hoping to find an existing match in the system. Hope was quickly squandered and it was revealed that the DNA found at the scene in 1981 didn't match anyone in the database. Eight years later, in May of 2019, with the help of funding from Crime Stoppers, the DNA was submitted into United Data Connect, a genealogical database capable of familial searches. This technology led detectives to relatives of a man named Donald Perea, who was a match in Jeannie's case. In fact, Perea's DNA showed that he was 3.3 trillion times more likely to have committed the crime than anyone else in the world. Investigators learned that when Jeannie accepted a ride from then 23-year-old Perea in 1981, he was out on bond for a separate sexual assault and kidnapping charge. Unfortunately, by the time his DNA was linked to Jeannie, it was discovered that Perea had passed away in 2012 due to undisclosed medical conditions, meaning he was never held accountable for the crime. Jeannie's parents also passed away before receiving any type of closure of what happened to their daughter. Two of her seven siblings spoke openly with reporters regarding the resolution in their sister's case. They expressed that they were glad that there was some sort of answer of what happened to their sister, but the old wounds were reopened and they're now trying to come to peace with the tragedy once again. Jeannie was like a second mom to her younger siblings, and they never stopped thinking about her and hoping to find peace. Hunter Smith was hitchhiking from Idaho to Nebraska in the summer of 2017. The charismatic 18-year-old was excited to start a new job as a manager at a fast food restaurant. After taking a Greyhound bus to Boise, Idaho from Burns, Oregon, he began accepting rides from people eager to start his new life in Nebraska and provide for his young daughter. Sometime in mid-June, Hunter was picked up by three friends, Nicholas, Montana, and Willie, aged 23, 21, and 34 respectively. 
The three befriended Hunter and invited him to Nicholas's residence to hang out and shoot guns in the nearby desert. It was here that unexpectedly, Nicholas shot Hunter point blank with seemingly no motive and had his friends help to remove Hunter's clothing and drag his body into a ditch. When Hunter's mother, Heather Smith, received a phone call on August 4th from one of her son's friends stating that they hadn't heard from him since July 20th, he was immediately reported as missing to the police. Nearly two and a half months would go by before body was discovered on August 21st. Hunter's mother would submit DNA for comparison and it would be confirmed that the remains were that of her 18-year-old son. When news broke about the discovery, Nicholas took to Facebook on October 23rd to share an article and express how close the location was to his home. A friend jokingly commented that Nicholas should have hidden the body better, which prompted Nicholas to reply, if it was me, I wouldn't have left him in the desert. Too much risk of Hunter stumbling on a dead body. LOL. Police were well aware of the post during their investigation, although it's unclear how. Nicholas was later charged with first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with 30 years fixed. He was also charged with criminal conspiracy, which brought another life sentence with 10 years fixed. Willie pleaded guilty as an accessory to first-degree murder, evidence destruction, and failure to notify authorities, and received 26 years in prison, with Montana spending 15 years behind bars for her role in Hunter's death for criminal conspiracy and failure to notify authorities. Hunter is fondly remembered by friends and family as being funny, charismatic, and artistic. His mother said that he had big dreams of breaking into the music industry. The tragic events that took place that day have devastated the entire family, including a two-year-old daughter who will now never know her father. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads.